Welcome to Nothing Moves Without Us, a bi-weekly podcast where we discuss the past 30 years of life entertainment through movies, media, TV shows. I'm your host, Clifford. And I'm Thomas. Welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah, it feels good to be back, man. You, you said that so nicely, too. Uh, go ahead, Cliff. Go ahead. I see you. I, I, I always appreciate your props. I always appreciate your yeah, props. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've been doing it. You know, it's what six, seven episodes in now, so it's great. I, sh- I, sh- I should get it right the first time, right? But it took me a couple of times. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. It's, we we growing, baby. Um, but uh, yeah, how's everything going? Everything's good, man. Everything's good. Um, like I said, it's been like you know, real quick before we started the, the recording. Like I said, uh, it's just been a good past few weeks in terms of just doing more what I need to for myself, just, uh, um, establishing. This the word is like boundaries, but also this. You know, c- cutting the ships, cutting the short shit short, as they say. Um, and it's been working. It's been working, man. I've been just very productive and putting putting more effort in, putting more effort in, and just realizing my, my setbacks, man. Um, yeah, usual, usual. Yeah. What about what about you, man? What about you? I saw you won another award. I saw Date Why You Wait won another award. Let's, you know, let's talk about that. <laughs> you always like to bring that up. Always like to bring that up. Yeah, uh, Yeah. I, I think exactly what you just said is. Something I'm learning as well is doing a better job celebrating my wins um, and being one of those people who are, are open to sharing it. Um, and I won't I won't jump deeply into it, but, you know, you and I had a conversation offline a little about social media and TikTok and, you know, looking at some of the value there and being more open to being uh, to sharing in those spaces because it's a challenge for, for me. So. Um, so, yeah, so this past week, I've. As I was telling you earlier, I took some time to create these accounts more so, you know, for my businesses to be able to to put it out into the world and stop being kind of a you know, a hermit. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but yeah, I'm good, bro. Things are good. I'm I'm always glad to be back with you. What's what's your innate, I guess, uh, what hesitation? Excuse me. <laughs> what's, your, what's your like innate hesitation? Thank you with posting on social. Uh, it just you know, taking the time to put together a narrative. And I feel like when you do it more specifically from a business, you want, you want everything to be cohesive. You want everything to look good. You want everything to be organized. You know, just want to throw things out there. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of one of those people that I like organization. I like things segmented. Right. And that's been a challenge. And also, I have so many different things that I do. What takes precedent precedent over something else? You know, what what's... Right, right. What's the focus? So I've been uh, really kind of dialed in to sharing all the things I have going on, but doing it in a way where it makes sense for, for me and who I am and just being more open to it. Right. I think part of my, I mean, I think we have a similar um, hesitation with social media. And for me, like I, I always have been flow, which is part of my issue with like productivity. Sometimes I'll just be in a zone and I'll just dish things out for like a week, or two weeks, a month. Then I'll just fall back, um, and I, this might kind of transition into some of the, the pre-show topics we want to talk about with, like, mental health. Um, just because of mental health, like, for me, sometimes it's not, like, not seeing the feedback, right? Like, you know the value. The like doesn't really equal the value, but you feel, you, you know, you feel, a, like I said, I said earlier, right? Sometimes you just feel a way, yeah. um, and it feels like it's not hidden, it's not connecting. But, like, those moments for me are kind of uh, time to pause and, like, reflect and see what's not working, fine-tune. Um, and like, since I started doing the TikTok, like I opened up, I started posting on my personal one, another podcast that I do with my homegirl. Um, and I was, and it's seeing a connectivity and saying, okay, this is just another lane. And I just need to find, again, let's find what works, man. Find what works on this level while still doing what I need to do for myself on a, on, a, on another level. Uh, we talked like earlier last, last month and you were saying that like now you're yeah, using a calendar, you're kind of planning ahead. So. That's something I, I think I might consider also in terms of putting it out there, man. Like putting it out there and whatever hits, hits. And just kind of riding that wave. Yeah. And also, you know, you it's okay to move at your pace. Um, I think sometimes we lose sight of that where, where we're always trying to keep up with the Joneses. And it's like, I'm not one of them. <laughs> I'm a Knox. <laughs> so uh, oh, right. so just staying on on – Staying focused on the task at hand, but doing it in my way, and and, yeah. and always growing as an individual. So, um, what's your what's your pace? What's what's your pace? I would say, my, or how would you how would you define your pace? Yeah, well, well, one is is talking about just being 
one of those people who like things organized. Like I have a set schedule on how I do everything. Um, and it's hard for me to transition that into the social media world. Um, right. So, you know, Monday I might do day while you wait stuff. Tuesday I might do podcast stuff. And that's literally what I work on for the entire eight hours of the day. Um, and if something comes in, I, it's very rare that I deviate and, and focus on that thing. I might reply to an email or something, but you won't catch me spending more than 10, 15 minutes on um, on something else, depending on what I have going on that particular day. So, um, and I also think from, from a pace standpoint too, I'm, I'm the type of person that I can't talk or I can't multitask. I can't do multiple things at once. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm working on something, my phone is to the side and I'm just focused on that. And uh, if, if, if I get any type of distraction or I, or it's, you know, something gets in the way, I have, I have the, <laughs> I have the personality where I can tell somebody, yeah, this is not the time I'll hit you up a little bit later. We'll talk about it later. Um, so essentially, yeah, that's, that's, that's what my piece is. Yeah. I think it also, the, the algorithm, like why you were speaking, I was thinking about the algorithm, right? Like, you know, you have the set schedule, um, where you put things out, but you know that it's an algorithm. And if you don't play with, if you don't play with the algorithm's rule, then what you're putting out has low reach and low, um, it becomes like a low effort purse excuse me, a low effort post. Like it's, it's like, you know, the, the game has changed, right? It's no longer just about creating, creating the content and putting it out there. It's about being aware of all the rules and how things are changing every single week, um, it's, it, which makes it more challenging. And I think like for me and you, like we're naturally creative. So our focus is just wanting to create and put it out there. And since we don't have, um, like, you know, uh, assistants or interns or whoever working for us, who enjoy like the technical aspect work, some of the work we do loses value. I think, I mean, I think for everyone, like a, the, that's the point of collaboration. At some point you find people who pick up where you, you're just not genuinely, genuinely, genuinely interested and you know, th think things hit off. So yeah. Yeah. You, you hit it right in the head. Um, um, I was gonna say, I feel like that's a good trans <laughs> transition yeah. to talk about Rus Russell West Westbrook. To the Lakers, man. Um, it's, Bless the rest you know, to the Lakers. What is happening? <laughs> uh, so, I think initially, I know you also want to talk about like Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka, and mental health. And since you brought it up, I feel like it kind of ties in <laughs> to mental health with LeBron James. And I'll, I'll I'll tie it in like later, you know, toward the end. Okay. So. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm number one. I'm not a just a pretext. I'm not a basketball person anymore. I used to watch it a lot as a kid. I, I really stopped watching once like Kobe hit his prime and like you know working at the NBA store. Like that was like the prime of being in basketball, enjoying it. Um, but then you just see it's just a business, and it's not really about the for me. It's not about the skill and the um, well. It's no longer about the skill. It's no longer about the sport. It's just about the business and making money, which I get. I'm like I said, the game's the game. Um, but, you know, he couldn't make it in Cleveland. LeBron James couldn't make it in Cleveland for whatever the reasons are. Went down to Miami with um, Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh and, you know, won some chips. Came back to Cleveland, won some chips, um, you know, and, and ends up in L.A. And this this year was supposed to be, like, their year, right? Like, they, he got everything he wanted. He got the, sh the shortest season because he's so tired from playing 82 games and working so hard and being on the court 24-7 because, you know, he, he wants to be primetime guy. But, they, but they, you know, they got elimin eliminated. Uh, who did they get eliminated by? It's the Phoenix Suns. Okay, they got eliminated by the Suns. First round. Uh, first round. Damn, she's right. Right. So, I... Uh, so, you know, he has Anthony Davis, right? Anthony Davis is, I think he's still kind of, how, how, how long has he been in the league? Like maybe uh, probably six, like, yeah, five, six years, years. But, but he was injured. He was injured in the playoffs. So that's, you know, that's, okay. that's something that the, uh, the Lakers kind of fall back on. It's like, yeah, our best, one of our best players were injured. Right, right, right. One out of the, how many players on the team? 15. That's the roster. <laughs> he, he's, a, he's a pretty important player though. <laughs> I know, no, no, no. Like I know he's dope, but the, the whole aspect is the team aspect, right? Since me, me not watching modern basketball and really looking at the older players, like you know, you, you always have someone. You always have someone who can step up. Um, but now the focus is really just for me. It looks like it's just really on on the big three. Um, so you know, he got his third person. He got his, his Russell Russell Westbrook. 
And I was thinking that it feels like LeBron James is a sore loser. And I was thinking about, like, his life transition, right? Like, I mean, he was, what, like, 6'5 in high school? Like, always been a tall kid that's destined for the NBA. So you consider that most of his life, I, I, I want to consider and I want to believe that most of his life he has gotten what he wanted. At a, at a certain point, once he, like, started on his path to basketball, everything he wanted, he got because people invested time and energy to him because they knew that it would pay off for him and, and them in the long run. So I see this play and I see him as being a sore loser. Like, I right, I didn't win the chip with just me and Davis. So let me call in a third big man to kind of, kind of get this going. Um, and it just feels corny to me, right? It, it feels corny um, in terms of this culture. It feels corny in terms of what it lead, what you know, what it's what it's already led to for the for the for the sport of basketball, and what it for me, you know, what it teaches young children, right? If you can't if you can't win on your own, just just keep stacking the team, <laughs> keep stacking the team until you you get you get what you want, you get your results. So I, 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 I'll leave it at that, just to kind of get your feedback. And yeah, yeah. Well, well, just just to uh, I guess backpedal for a sec. The reason you know we wanted to talk about this was. You know, we wanted to share how culture or how this particular move affect affects the culture, right? And you, you brought it up toward the end around young people seeing kind of like, you know, buying championships, right? Not working hard. Um, and, and not saying that he doesn't work hard. He does work hard. He does work hard. Yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm just kind of paraphrasing. But if you want to dive okay, in a little okay. deeper, you can, you can, you know, you're more than welcome to dive a little, a little, in a little deeper. But I, I, that's that's essentially what I heard it. What did you mean um, when you were saying around young people in the culture and culture? Just stacking the team. It, it's easier to. So, like, I, I like the way that you phrase it because it, it, it kind of challenges my perspective. Right. So he definitely works hard. I know he works hard um, as a player, and as an athlete. I think on one aspect, the times where I have watched him play, it's a lot of him being the go to guy continuously. So I understand the need for less NBA games. And I understand, I understand the need of wanting to rest. Like, you know, there's this whole, from, from what I'm aware of, again, I don't watch, um, you know, athletes taking days off, you know, sit, you know, sit, sit in the game, sit, like, sitting games out to rest and recuperate. Um, and it's, 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 for me, it's, it's not showing up to work, right? Like work, work is work. I understand that it's, it's entertainment, but work should be work. And I think it sets the precedent to let people know that you know once you re- once you reach a certain level in life you can just kind of do what you want to do and you can take away from the experience right like if, I, if i'm if i go to a nets game like me and alex have a had a a, net, a brooklyn nets and lakers bet um and like at, it was like a five year five year call it a five year gentleman bet and at a certain point whichever team had the best record we would like you know the, the, the loser buys the winner tickets to a game and we sit down and watch so if I go to a Lakers Nets game and LeBron James wants to be off today, I'm I'm disappointed. As as a fan, I came to watch the best athlete in the world play, but he wants to rest today. Um, so I think it, I think it's a disservice to people who are fans, people who who are supporters. Um, and I think for the again for the going back to like the, the younger children, it shows them that they. They don't have a res- the only responsibility they have is to themselves. I think that's what that's kind of what it is. That's what it feels like. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I you know I have a, a slightly different perspective, uh, more specifically around this this, this trade for Westbrook. Um, I do think that you know the Lakers and and you know the big market teams they they have an, a competitive advantage because of the the, the, the cities they they're in because of the economy in those cities and you know, the business opportunities for players. So a lot of players want to go to certain destinations, right? Miami, New York, LA. Um, so, you know, th- that's one side of it. But I also, you know, want to take a different kind of perspective because I hear what you're saying. I think that that's that's definitely, a, those are definitely points. And one thing about LeBron, I do give him credit. He don't he don't sit out unless he hurt. Like he will play, uh, he will play. Um, so I give him credit there. But uh, when, uh, when you, we talked about talking about this trade. What came to mind for me is um, how Russell Westbrook um, is maturing as a player, right? And and yeah. and, it, and the reason it came that came to mind was because 
he's been a part of these teams that have had great play. He's played with probably three or four of the best players ever, like that are ever going to play the game. And he, and he hasn't been, he hasn't been successful in other people's eyes. Um, He's been successful in his eyes. One thing that he, he, he continues to say is like, Hey man, I don't need to necessarily win championships. I just want to be able to take care of my family, like get out the hood and take care of my family and inspire people to inspire young people. And that's kind of his mindset. Um, and hear me, hear me out. No, no, I'm, I'm, I wasn't into that. <laughs> I, I paused, I paused. I got you. So, I know I talked for a lot. And so, so I think you know when you look at when you look at that side of things, it, it changes. It changes it straight up for me because, at, as you know, some people may or may not know, he's from LA. He went to UCLA. Um, so g- going to LA to to play is, you know, in some ways is is any kid's dream that's from that city. You know, you, they, you always hear DeMar DeRozan talking about it. You hear uh, Kawhi, you hear Porto. All those guys are from the L.A. area. So when I heard that he got traded to L.A., it really didn't – it wasn't no big thing to me because I, from from a basketball standpoint, I don't think they're going to be that great. <laughs> um, I, and I'm, I watch a lot of basketball. I just don't think it, it, it takes a lot to, to – more than three people to win a championship. You, you have all these teams who have the big three, and it doesn't – they didn't win last year, but also injuries played a huge part in that, including the Lakers. And then on the flip side, I just really looked at it as if Russell Westbrook is going to be successful or he's going to win a championship, what better place to do it? Like it, 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 of all the chances he's had in his career, this is this is the chance. He's home. There's really no excuse. He's home. He's, he's where he's from. He's on a team that has the that has the uh, talent, that has the players. He has arguably the best player ever to play the game. There's no yeah. excuse. Um, and from a cultural standpoint, I just really believe that um, sports in general, they're, they're kind of all over the place because, and, and me and my dad, we talked about this this morning, how players, you know, you get you get picked by a team, you sign a contract, and then that team trades you or that team lets you go or, you know, you underperform and they let you go. Or even if you even if you overperform, they let you go. So, right, right. you know, basketball is a job you know being an athlete is a job and at the end of the day these organizations are going to do what's best for them and i I hate to be this guy but they're all 95 percent of these organizations in every sport are owned by some rich white man (laughs) a white family um and michael jordan uh (laughs) so, (laughs) so you know you think about how that plays a role in it as well you know and there's just so many different dynamics but you know, I'll leave it at that. I just think that right now it's it's his time. You know, they, if the Lakers can't do it with Westbrook, his career is pretty much over. LeBron got a ring. AD got a ring. LeBron got several rings. So now it's his time to shine. And, you know, I wish him the best. We'll, we'll see how it goes. So uh, the, the, fa- the reason why I made the face earlier because you, know, you brought up the quote of him saying he doesn't want to win a chip. He just wants to feed his family and all of that. And I was trying to pull up an article um, from, like, 2015. Oh, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to, I think he says he's trying to, like, look out for kids in the hood or, you know, promote the, you know, support the youth or whatever. Um, and the article was, you know, he, he, he signed a deal with Mountain Dew, like $125 million or something. And, you know, my thought is, who, how does that help anyone, right? Like, we, we, we look at... Now, and I, I think we'll kind of touch on this when we talk about fresh too, right? We talk, look at the the impact of individual choices versus the or the, the choices for yourself versus the longstanding effects and how your choices impact people. So, like I was thinking about, um, I was listening to What's Free when Meek Mill, Jay Z, and Rick Ross, and they, and, you know, Rick Ross, you know, Meek Mill was like, you know, talking about how you know all, all these young kids were sent into college, right? Do so you think about the average? top tier rapper, right? They say they sell 500,000 albums, right? For, for On their first, first week. That $500,000, those 500,000 albums, the content, right? The, the content of hip hop has been negative. It has been, um, it, it has promoted all, all the negative aspects of like the black experience and what kind of fuels the, the ne- negative stereotypes of how black people are portrayed. So you, I don't, I don't believe that sending 10, 20 kids through college 
has enough culture, has more significance or impact than endorsing Mountain Dew, which is a sugar, you know, a, a, a sugar rich drink that is bad and toxic for your body. I don't believe in um, promoting violence and hate and degrading women and then saying, oh, well, look, you know, we're sending these young kids through college. The, the, the individual choice has more significant and long lasting negative impacts. Um, and I know that's, that's kind of left, but I think with, I mean, I think our perspective is different. Like I'm looking at it on, on LeBron's aspect because of course he brought Westbrook in. You're looking at it as West, Westbrook is kind of, you know, doing what he needs to do for himself. Like, like he, he, he's, he's at his wits end, right? Like he's been trying, he's like, you said, he's been on a lot of different teams. Um, just never, you know, never, never got what he really, really, really needed. Um, so yeah, I, I, def- I definitely get your perspective. Yeah. I think your perspective is, is spot on though. Like, you know, history shows that anytime a LeBron team loses they, the next year, they, they literally wipe the team. <laughs> they create a brand new team from scratch. They're just, they're just what LeBron does. And that's the impact he has. And if we talk about impact, you know, I talked more so about uh, Westbrook, but if, if you look at LeBron's impact, you know, LeBron has open schools, right? LeBron, LeBron's right. changed cities. I think just a school. I don't, I, 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 is it plural or singular? He's open a school, okay. Uh, okay. No, no. I, I just want. No, no. I just want to. No, no. If, if, if we're gonna, if, if we're gonna say, I want to just be accurate with it, right? That's, that's absolutely fair. <laughs> I'm not trying to get at you. <laughs> LeBron is open one school. Is the Promise School? It is in Ohio. Yeah, of course, uh, yeah. So, so, but. but you know, he's done all these things that, that basically he's the the black messiah when it comes to sports. You know, he's he's a he's a straight shooter, he's doing all the right things. And it's like are witnesses. You know, it's it's great, right? It's great to see. But to your point, uh and I you know, I hate to I hate to do this, but I, I just can't help myself. I always think that all these athletes and all these people that get all this shine and then out of nowhere you hear that LeBron cheat on his wife, you know, 10 years from now, we hear LeBron cheat on his wife, then what, right? Oh, we hear, you know, we hear just some crazy, and, and then everybody's like, oh, man, he's this crazy guy, like, he's not human. You know, he's right. a human, you know, we make mistakes, and no, nobody's perfect. Um, right. But it's just mind-blowing to me, because he's one of those players who, when you think about it, he's had essentially a perfect career. His career is more, uh, it's more, I guess, prestigious, than even MJ in some way, just from where he right. where he started to where he is now, you know, and uh, so yeah, I, I think this is a great combo, and I think it's important that we talk about it because you know you see different dynamics, um, and you know we, we you know we'll, we'll dive briefly into some some of what's happening in in sports around mental health and, and athletes like yo listen. I had to do this for my mental health, and now mental health look is being looked at it like a real injury, <laughs> like you broke your leg or like you sprained your ankle, and um, it's just interesting to see how. To your point, LeBron James, if he misses a game, I paid up, you know, I paid two hundred dollars. It could be my last two hundred dollars, or I worked six months at the plant to make this two hundred, and he ain't play hard, you know. So, right, 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 right. you know, you bring up a lot of good points, and I think there's a lot there. And we can definitely dive into it. I think, and you know, definitely another time, but. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's a great topic. I, I just want to make one, one one point in kind of what we said. Like, I, I don't want to position it like, because it, it sounds selfish, right? Like, you know, I spent my last two hundred dollars, and it's you know he ain't playing me, me, me. Um, and it, it's not really about that. It's not really about that. But I think it's just the co- kind of like the collective experience, right? The, the job is supposed to be entertainment, also, um, and I think it's it's more so. Yeah, I think it's, it's it's losing that factor in terms of just uh, I don't know, um, just making making it about self need and go self need and goals, which I understand. Like I'm I'm all, I'm all think self first, but I think that there's a collective and um, there's a responsibility in terms of effort to kind of bring up, like bring up the next generation, right? Like so let's say like developing another player, right? So Anthony Davis injured, right? Who's the next player? That has been cultivated to take his spot in case he gets injured. So now someone else, someone else is kind of losing a spot, and I understand that's the nature of the game. Um, but something interesting that just kind of like added on to my, like, like I said, feeling away about this is that you know L.A. criminalizes criminalized homelessness. 
So starting, I believe, August, um, I think it's August 15th, homelessness is illegal in Los Angeles. So I'm thinking about like the duality of worlds, right? You have these rich athletes um, getting money and entertaining rich people who can afford the tickets. And now you have all these people who are going to be homeless in a few, in a month or so, and they have nowhere to go. Um, so my hope as always is, you know, like is, is hoping that there's a social responsibility to, you know, with Westbrook being home, right? Like do something for the, for the population, do something for the people that, that are hungry. Um, but yeah, that's just my, that's, that's me nitpicking being one of those people to critique. Yeah. I have some thoughts, but I, I'm, I'm gonna hold them. We, we could talk about it <laughs> right, right, another right. time. Um, but yeah, I, I hear you. I agree. I agree with you. It's the same exact thing when it comes to looking at, you know, turning arenas into uh, testing sites for for COVID. <laughs> for COVID, yeah. like, you know, is I, I, okay. That's cool. <laughs> like bigger issues, man. Bigger right? issues. But, uh, but yeah, this is this is great. I, I I appreciate you bringing it up, and I don't think we ne- we necessarily need to jump into. Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka. I just brought them up earlier because I think, you know, they deserve the same, same kind of respect these these white players are getting, like Aaron Rodgers and other players right. that are talking about their mental health. Um, right. I just think that when a, when a black person says anything about anything, we we always get. It just yeah, like that. you say anything about anything, anything. And that, that's the truth right anything about anything hi well you, you shouldn't have said hi i prefer hello i said right you're right, you're right. It, it just it just mind blowing to me and it, and it frustrates me so much because uh you know i watched uh i watched i watched some some uh some some pod, po- podcast or i don't want to say it was fox because it, it wasn't fox but fox has said things about it as well uh Tucker Carlson and other people, but um, I watched someone call some some old uh, bios selfish, and in my head I was like, "This woman has won <laughs> numerous medals for this <laughs> for this country." Right, right, right. Like numerous. In my mind, like I said, whenever you have an off day or off moment, especially when you're in the public eye, you could you could look at like shit, but. If it, if it's some you know a white athlete or if it's someone of a certain stature that is white, it's cool. It is like, all right. They feel this way. So I, I'm you know Naomi Osaka, Simone Biles, um, Biles. I'm with you. I'm with you, ladies. Um, there there are obviously other athletes that have come out and you know said, hey, I, and I've done this for my mental health. I've done that for my mental health. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. If they have a problem with it, that's their problem. You know what we look, but you know we forget athletes are human too. Right. That's it. They they eat shit, sleep. The, the, like women, the women still they they're no, no no different than other people. They just get paid a lot more to to perform a task that you know we can we can argue is is you know they're being overpaid or the kids and people they're humans. So right. uh, I'm just really it just really frustrates me about anybody talking about their mental health and being ridiculed for it. And it, I mean, I guess that's kind of the parallel to the NBA players, like taking time off uh, physical and mental health days. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's like on, on one aspect, like I understand the, the job part, right? It's, I understand the terms of representation and, um, you know, fulfilling your role, fulfilling your, your, your duty or, what, what, you know, whatever you signed up for. Like, to me, I, I always look at things as a social contract. But, you know, we're, in, we're, we're transitioning into a place where I think seeing how easily social bonds are just being pulled apart, more people no longer, people don't feel like they have to honor their social contracts, especially um, at the cost of their own mental health. Like, you know, I've, I've done enough, like you said, I mean, I mean, how much? How many awards does she have total, right? So, I've done enough. I pushed myself enough. Like you know, let someone else eat. Let someone else eat. Yeah. Um, also, just to, to to piggyback on that, so Simone uh, Biles decided to withdraw because she because she didn't want to be a distracted distraction to her teammates. 
<laughs> like, like for, it was for a mental health. That was one side of it, but it was also like, listen, I don't want to distract. I don't want the pressure that's on me to distract you guys. And right. there are other players on her team that have one goal because she she removed herself from the situation. Not and not only did she remove herself, but she didn't leave them. She didn't like come back to the stage. She stood there with them by their side right, to support right, right, them. Right. I I don't I just don't get it. We we t- today's society needs to stop that bullshit. People deserve to be treated like people, especially black people. And I and I'm just big on that. We 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 got to take it, take it because they're not gonna give it to us. Um, so this young lady has killed it. Killed it for, like, killed it for you United. I could see if, if she was a nuisance, if she was rude, if she had, no, she's, she's been a model citizen. And then she's like, you know what? I'm not doing too good. These are the things I need to do for myself. And she's being attacked for it. I, I, I got a problem with that. So, uh, right. so yeah. Uh, so real quick, uh, 25 medals total, 19 gold, three silvers, three bronzes. And it's the, I guess the last point, um, to your point, you said, she, you know, she she didn't dip. She's there. She's supporting. And, again, I feel like this kind of ties into to, to the uh, Lakers aspect. She didn't want to neg- negatively influence her team. And other people st- stood up and did what they needed to. Um, because that's, like, that's the, that's the team aspect. That's, that's the team aspect that I feel like is missing from, I guess, modern-day sports. But, yeah, 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 um, yeah. You got me fired up for this convo now. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, let's uh, – I mean, I, I definitely didn't think we'd, we'd rock out on this for this long. But, um, yeah, let's talk about Fresh, man. 1994, yeah. Fresh, uh, written and directed by Boaz Akin. And it is available on – I watched it on Prime through the Paramount, Paramount channel. I had a free trial. How did you watch it? Uh, I was able to go, go into <laughs> – the hood archives because <laughs> I definitely went to Amazon to, to watch it and I did not have a free trial to, right, right, right. to Paramount. So, uh, so I was able to get it from my, the DVD guy down the block. <laughs> right. uh, let me so, stop. Uh, uh, a, a dope cast. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, I, I, I uh, was able to watch it by getting it from a, a website. Let's put it like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I, I feel like it's counterproductive to be like, yo, I never, never mind, never mind, never mind. I'm not, I'm not going to set us up, let me set us up, right? But um, <laughs> a dope cast, uh, I think Breaking Star, Sean Nelson, um, Giancarlo Esposito, who is like well known for, uh, I mean, a bunch of things. He's in a new Star Wars uh, series world. He's in Breaking Bad. Samuel Jackson, who just always looks the same age, no matter what year he is. Um, so, so I know you, you said it wasn't your first time watching it, right? So, what were your initial, initial, I guess, reconnected memories like going to going into the show and watching the show? Yeah, well, uh, I'm pretty sure it's a movie, but you know, I'm coming. Sure, yeah, I'm you're right, you're right. I'm not coming for you, though. You know, no, no, nah, come, come for me. Come for me. Like, yo, we're supposed to, we're supposed to look out. Yo, Cliff, it's uh, a movie. Let's get, like, you ain't got to. <laughs> I don't understand people, right? Like, just correct my mistake. I'm all right. Uh, correct my mistake, bro. Uh, I think uh, it's a movie. Uh, so you don't know either. <laughs> what am I doing? What, what are we here for? If you don't know, right? If you don't, what are you here I'll, just, for? I'll just mess with you because this is what we, this is what we do. But, uh, but no, no, my, my initial thoughts, uh, when I when when jumping into it was, it, it's so '90s. Like it, it took me back to being a '90s kid. Like it reminded me of home. Right. A lot of things that, you know, that Michael was doing. That's that's the main character, Michael and Fresh. You know, the people. You know, di- different different names for different uh, audiences. Um, but right. but essentially, just you know, how the the film started out and, you know, the how they were showing the city. That's how I remember it. Literally, I was like, "Yo, this is my childhood. This is how I used to rock with my homies when I was right. in school." And uh, yeah, it was it was it was uh, kind of a blast for the past for me. I, I really I was really really taken back by it. And you know, like like I told you, I've seen the movie before, but obviously I saw it probably sometime in two thousand early two thousands. Um, and I, I didn't remember it, or it didn't hit it didn't hit me as much as it did now. 
one, because I was a different age and it was a different time frame, but two, I'm watching the movie specifically for this podcast. So right. there's some there were some uh some things that stood out. But yeah, man, it just it just reminded me of like that's how I remember the nineties. Everything about it, like him him walking the streets and playing in the play, playground and you know, the conversations he was having with his friends and playing chess in the park. It, all all that was all those things is what I remember from home, you know, being from New York. So so yeah, how about yourself? Um, so I, I realized that I saw this movie when it initially came out. My parents took me to see it. I think it was like the first movie we saw in the theaters. And like watching it last night, um, my Erica watched the beginning with me. She's like, your parents took you to see this? And I'm like, yeah. Like, <laughs> like they, I don't think they knew what it was. Um, and I remember like seeing it fresh as a kid and being like, yo, he looks just like my, my cousin. And he's yeah, he's problematic, but it's like my cousin. <laughs> but um, it it didn't it didn't hit me as a child, right? Like, I just you know, I was just watching it. It was just it was just storytelling. But like watching it as an adult and seeing the um, just going through the scenes, man, and you know, re- reliving the '90s, like you said, right? Reliving the reality of what the '90s were. People shooting up basketball courts because a ball a ball got stuffed. Some of black, black, you know, black they shot. This weak, fragile egos, man. And I feel like that's what a lot of this movie shows. Um, and it's 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 a sad movie, bro. Like it's a it's a it's a heavy and sad movie. Like as an adult watching this and seeing the the gener the what what my life could have I mean what our lives could have been right like these these could have been our experiences because we were growing up in that time we, we were both I was living in Brooklyn were you living in Brooklyn at the time I wasn't and then, to be honest it was my experience <laughs> like I did that um, was my lifestyle so. yeah so you know there's like the the one side of where it is the heavy the drug game the the danger the violence the the fear as as a child but then. The other side, like, you know, you see fresh, like really living that life. And I think what I really loved about it was the, I guess, the the kind of the duality of experiences. In most cases, right, I think in most cases, in most schools, in most situations, there's only a few kids like really living that life. And the rest of the kids just posing. Everyone's friend, like you look at his friend Chucky or Chucky, he said, you know, (laughs) You could call me Chuck E, you know, like Chuck D, but Chuck E, right? That I don't want to call Chuck E no more. Right? And you look at, you know, you look at all the kids in their baggy clothing and the, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the hip hop influence, right? And hip hop, hip hop kind of creates this, um, this culture in the nineties. And part of it, you end up seeing like the end result and with the experiences of like, you know, Chuck E thinking he's harder than what he is, right? You know, he 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 finally gets invited to hustle with Fresh, and now you know he now he got a squad. Now he's the man because because he because he's affiliated with the man who knows the man. Now he thinks he's hard, but the end result, right? He he, he thought he thought he was hard because he had it done, and he loses his life. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so, you know, just to to clarify, when I said I lived that lifestyle, a lot of people may not know about me about me, and I'm sure you do. We've talked about it. Uh, growing up, my mom was heavily um, on drugs, um, addicted to crack cocaine. So much of my childhood, my dad, my parents, both my parents were in my life, but my dad worked nights, so he so he couldn't take care of me because you know I went to school during the day and at night he was at work. So I ended up in the foster care system. I was there for for many years. I've I've been in many group homes. Um, there was there was a time I was even uh, I was even evaluated in the psych ward because I, because of my mom was using drugs and, uh, you know, her and I got into it. So, um, and there's so much more, but, but, uh, I just wanted to clarify that cause I'm, I'm not trying to be hard or trying to put something out there that, right, right, right. that I'm not, that, that, that literally was my lifestyle. Like a lot of what I saw in the film is what I dealt with, um, growing up and I wasn't hustling or anything like that, but I, I've been around hustlers. I've been around drug abusers or substance abusers, not just drugs, but substance abusers. I've seen that lifestyle and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very blessed and to, to be able to, to be where I am today. Um, and this film just brought out a lot of what I, what I was going through and, and, uh, it, it reminded me literally of, of, of growing up in New York in those times. So, um, so that's what I meant. And, and I, I think, you know, you bring up a great point too around, you know, how this, the, 
like you, like you said, the duality around fresh, the, the, the duality between Michael and fresh. Hey, right? Michael was this kid who, who lived at home with his aunt who took in all the kids because she wanted a better life for them, right? All his cousins. Yeah, and... Like 10, 11 kids total. <laughs> yeah. So, right? so, he, so he's, he, you know, he's kind of putting his front on for them. And then, you know, he goes to school and, you know, one thing that really stood out there was he was, he really valued school. The, the film starts out with him making a run and he's like, yeah, I got to get to school. I got to get to school. Right, right. And everybody else is kind of downplaying it. He's like, dead ass serious. He's like, yo, I need to get to school. You know, my, t- my teacher's going to give me some shit for this. And, and, he, and he took education real serious. Um, so, you know, he's playing both sides of the coin and he, and he's doing it in a way where uh, he's trying his best at, I don't know how old he was, maybe what, what would you say? 13, 14, 15, maybe even younger than that. Um, I would say like 12, yeah. 13. Yeah, I feel like early early teens would be good. And, uh, you know, he, he's this kid playing this, playing these 12 roles. 12-year-old, sorry. Oh, he's it 12. says it. Okay. So, 12-year-old, yeah, yeah. So he's a 12-year-old playing these, these uh, playing these roles that, you know, hustlers in the, in the, in the 20s and 30s can't do. <laughs> uh, and he, and he, and you know, some of the things that he was doing when, he, like, the way he spoke up for his sister and the way he didn't let people talk about him, to me, it was just so, it was so ill. Like, yo, this kid right. has, has some, has some balls on him. And, uh, and yeah, there's just a lot of, a lot of really cool things that stood out. And there were a lot of sad things that, uh, broke my heart and, and, uh, made a lot of sense for me by the time the film ended. Yeah. I, I was trying to, I, while watching it this time, part of my thoughts was wondering what, where did it come from? Like, where does this innate desire to care about family, you know, to care about education, um, to kind of pre-plan and uh, pre-plan, yeah, pre-plan and go through all these plans. Like, where did it come from? Like throughout the story, you see it unfolding with him. Uh, you know, his, his, his dad is played by Samuel Jackson. And his father doesn't live with him because, like you said, he mentioned he lives with his aunt. But he goes to, um, I believe it's Washington Square Park to play yeah. chess for Samuel L. Jackson. And, you know, Samuel L. Jackson, his, his dad is just schooling him on a game. Um, his, name is, his dad's name is Sam. Sam is just schooling him on a game of chess and preparing, um, like one of the favorite, one of the the lasting quotes that has stood out stood out to me throughout my whole life, even watching it as a child, was when I think it's the second time they're playing. Or maybe no, it's the first time they're playing chess, and he's like, Sam Sam is is saying, you know, what kind of play am I, offensive or defensive? At first, just kind of pausing, he's thinking about it. He's like, neither. I play my opponent. If my opponent is on a defense, I force them into action. If my opponent is you know attacking me, I. I make them get defensive. I shake things up. And that, that kind of became like one of my innate life philosophies uh, in terms of just interacting with people, knowing that everyone is individual and reacting and interacting with people kind of based on that. And I think it's so some of his, his stance and some of his, uh, maybe most of his views on, um, I guess, planning com- comes from playing chess, like being a chess master. You know, chess is integrated this is kind of lightly into the show, light, light skew, I keep saying show, <laughs> lightly into the movie. Um, but I think it, it has the most significance in terms of seeing the end game. You know, maybe he sees his sister as the as the queen. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that might be it. Maybe he sees his sister as the queen because that's the only like real real blood family he had in his, has in his life. And his responsibility is to get all the plays out of the way so that he can, you know, save her from, save her and himself. From this, you know, crazy, crazy world, man. Yeah, you hit it right in the head, man. The notes I took were all all along that, right? So, you know, there's this new Netflix special, uh, The Queen's Gambit. Have you checked it out? Uh, I think. I, well, I, I won't go deeply into it, but essentially, it's a show about um, this young lady who is uh, uh, her mom dies in a car accident. Do and, and that's how the show starts off. Won't go deeply into it, like I said, but essentially she ends up in an orphanage. She discovers that she's really good at chess due to a number of different things. Don't want to give the show away, but by the end of the show, she ends up basically putting women on the map as master chess players. You know, it's like seven, eight episodes. Um, Fresh watching Fresh was like the hood queen's gambit 
for me. <laughs> like the black version of the Queen's Gambit. Um, I feel like chess was a metaphor of Fresh's life. Um, everything that he did was a chess move. Everything. Saving his money. Um, he even, he, you know, it, it, there's a part in the film where he he comes up with this master plan to get everybody, to, to basically get out of the game. He's like, I, I, I need to get out myself and my sister out of this situation because all his friends are dying. And he's like, yeah, I need to, I need to, he, he never says it, but he starts making moves that allow him to do this. And he's been saving all this money. And, it, you know, people are asking him, which, which I thought was incredible when his friends are like, yo, you're making, uh, Chucky's like, are you making all this bread? And, you know, what are you doing with it? And he didn't say a word. Bro. He didn't, he yeah. didn't like, oh, well, it's hair. And I do this. He kept it to himself. And, you know, he, he moved, he let his actions speak. Um, and I really loved, really, really, really loved how he, he was still a kid. He still had those moments where he was shy around the girl and, and, <laughs> and he, you know, he had those moments where, you know, his, his, he, he, he let his father lead. He let his father teach him, but there was times where he like spoke up for himself, um, even to his father. Um, and it just was, it, it, that was, that was, those are the, those are kind of the rewarding things, but you know, you look at how, and, and I'm watching a film and I say to myself, this kid never has time to mourn. Like people, right. he, people were dying in front of him, getting shot in front of him. Like he loses the young lady that he's into. He, I guess you could say it's his little girlfriend. You know, it's a shorty. Shorty, he feeling, she feeling him. She ends up getting shot. Then some kid that he, he he's in gym class with ends up getting shot. The person that shoots the kid is basically one of the, the head dealers. Um, so he knows the person. And right after that, he's in the police station, not mourning, like not crying, not shedding a tear, not. Oh, they literally like, yo, this is the hood mentality. This is what a dealer does. You know, this is, this is my life. Um, and as the film goes on, he just sees so much, so much death and he never mourns. And in my mind, I'm like, this is crazy. And, you know, obviously at the end of the film, it, it finally catches up to him. Like mm-hmm. he, he, he had, he like, he just busts out in tears and, 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 it, and he, it catches up. He has to, he's gone through all this because I believe, and you can you can share your thoughts. I believe it, it, those are tears of relief. Like, yo, I finally put myself in a situation to to get the fuck out of this situ- out of this out of this game. Um, yeah. And you know, we we could dive into kind of how it happened, but essentially, he set up this master plan to to put all the dealers against each other, <laughs> and it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It worked to perfection. He did it so meticulously and magical, like like playing chess, like like a chessboard. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, uh, so yeah, man, I, I'm, I was really hurt for him and, and I'm, I'm hurt for him now, you know, thinking about the film, but I'm, the, the way it ended was, was perfect, you know, or oh, was as good as it could to watch him just finally lay like release. Right, right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that was, that was going to be one of my questions. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of lead into it. Just, uh, just kind of talking about like, like the, the really emotional scenes, right? So. You know, I brought up, you know, people shooting up the park, right? He's playing basketball. One of the drug dealers gets crossed, right? The kid just does a little spin move on him. His ego is frail and hurt. He's like a grown man in his 20s. He comes, comes back. Jake. Shoots up, shoot, yeah, Jake. Shoot, shoots shoots the kid. And you just, and you know, it, it's great cinematography also, which I think is important to kind of, um, you know, give props to the director. You, you, you think it's just uh, the basketball, the, kid, the young kid that's playing basketball. But he's, you know, you see Fresh walk in. He's, he walks past the basketball that's been shot in his flat. He walks past this dying friend who's bleeding. And he, you see the girl, the little girl that he's crushing on. And she has her hands on her throat. She's just, you see her legs shaking and she's just twitching. He walks up to her, puts his arms, his hands around her throat, stop the bleeding. And he's just staying there. Doesn't shed a tear. Fake. Yeah. She stops moving. The scene fades out. He's just sitting there, just looking straight ahead. The cops bring him in, right? The the next scene where, you know, Chucky, or later on, right? Chucky doesn't listen, right? You think he's a gangbanger. He ain't listen. I got to let you go, right? Chucky, Chucky gets murdered. Um, 
he, you know, he, he does the master plan where he's outside of the bodega and he's watching all these drug dealers to shoot each other. And he's just sitting there eating a Snickers bar. It's eating a Snickers bar like it's entertainment. Word. Crazy. No, no feeling. And then finally, right, finally, him and sister are going to be safe. You know, they probably get moved to a different city or state. And he just walks up to his father. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And what, and what, I'm, I'm going to stop you real quick because I, I think there's a scene that you're missing that is, that's pivotal in this. And it's a scene when uh, uh, I can't remember the what's what's the, the Hispanic dealer. What's his name? Uh, I can't. Which one? There's a lot. Esteban. 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 When Esteban is uh, comes out of the room slaying with his sister. Right, right. And she looks, she's. And she I looks strung out. Up. Yeah, she looks yeah. strung out. And and he and he and and he asked Chucky with him, and Chucky's like, "Yo, he's just banging his sister." Um, and the reason I bring that up is because all these scenes, this kid does not a shed a tear. He he doesn't show a, a, he, like any emotion. <laughs> he literally right, just right, like right. It, it, you 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 can tell as the film goes on, he just like put in his memory bank. Like okay, right. Um, but right. I got got finish it though. I, I thought that scene was important at as well yeah, yeah, yeah i think every incident like so like even when oh i also missed another scene and thank you for bringing that up you know after, after um jake kills this his you know the kid that played basketball and the girl he was crushing on they had a dog fight with chucky because chucky wants to fight there the rock and jake comes in and freshes is staring at him no emotionless right emotionless so no one can read his face he's he is he is the definition of stoicism right you do not know what's going on through this man's mind um, and so all you know his, is his, are his words, and he he you know he's able to just kind of ring words together to kind of create the plot. He's looking at Jake, just no emotion. Jake looks at him, and then Jake you know goes about his business. After Chucky gets after Chucky dies, Fresh takes their dog, um, and he's like, you know, like you know, I think from what I remember. Like once a pit bull like gets into that experience of killing another pit bull or killing another dog, killing another animal, it's just it just something is unleashed in them, and you you, know, you got to get rid of it, unfortunately. So he takes his dog, he takes his beloved dog that he's been fighting with Chucky. Like nah, nah, she she's not gonna fight. He's not. I think I forget the dog's name, um, but you know he or she, the dog isn't gonna fight. And dog fights, the dog wins. Chucky Roscoe. dies at Roscoe. There we go. Thank you. And he takes the dog's leash, he ties it up on a fire escape, and the dog is just hanging there, and he just takes the gun that Chucky had and shoots it. It's nothing, man, nothing, nothing, nothing. So the final scene, right, after everything is cleared, all the drug dealers, or the majority of the drug dealers are dead, Esteban is on his way to prison, he goes to Washington Square Park, sits in front of his dad, and dad's like, yo, you're an hour late, man, you know, wasting my time, but a lot is berating him. And he takes, uh, like, Sam kept the, the chess pieces in, like, a brown paper bag. He pours them out. His dad is talking. He's just staring at him. He's staring at him. And then he fe- he blinks, and the tears just come out si- simultaneously. And she just opens his mouth slowly. And, you know, I, I, I forgot the movie. I forgot the movie. And I'm just watching, 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 and it ends. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think he says to his father? What do you think he says to his father? I don't. It's such a it's such a powerful scene. The way the way you, you you describe it is great. But I think the thing that 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 is also is interesting about that scene is that majority of the scene while he's doing that is you just see Samuel Jackson's face. You just see Sam's face, and you just see him going in. And then there's a quick oh. shot of him, and obviously he's crying. But I don't know. I, I really. I, I don't. I don't. I don't think. He said, "Like I, I think Fresh." Well, yeah. Cons- consider at some point he has to say something. At some point I, he has to say something. So, what, what do I don't, you think? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's hard because I feel like he. I don't. I don't it's hard to say because he's. A, I feel like he just was, was free. Maybe he says, "I'm free," or maybe like you know, I can move on, or like maybe something along those lines. I just don't. I just don't even see him doing that. I see him just right. sitting there crying, leaving that shit out, and going on with, going on with his life. Like uh, I don't, I don't see him having a conversation with his dad about that because right. he never talked to, to his dad about gang banging. Never. I, I don't remember him right, having right, a conversation right. ever about him dealing drugs. He talked about his sister, so maybe he tells him she's safe because because 
the father, Sam, Sam is the father of both, both fresh and his sister. Yeah. Nicole. Yeah. Um, Nicole. Yeah. So maybe he's, he's like, dad, she's safe. You know, she's good. She's safe. Um, because that was something that he would, he took great pride in is being there for his sister. Um, yeah. And he made sure that not only was he there for his sister, but that nobody came for his sister. He he was like, "Yo, you're not going to talk about my sister." And 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 obviously she was someone who was on drugs and was doing things. But even with that, he he let her do what she did, but he kept a close eye. He yeah, knew he yeah, knew yeah. he knew how she how her cards are being played or her pieces being played. So so to, you know to stay on topic and answer your question, I really believe he probably just was like, you know, she's safe. Or Nicole safe dad, or she's good, or, or it's over, or something like that. Right. Um, but yeah, what what about you? Yeah, I was kind of I was leaning along along the lines of like I'm we're free, or you know we're we're, we're leaving, um, we're, we're, we're getting out of here. You know, those are the only things that kind of stuck out to me. Um, but also, I, I forget you said something a few minutes ago. You said that he's always keeping an eye out on her to like to make sure. Um, you know, things aren't too bad for her. So thinking about that scene, thinking about the end result of them both being free and the police saying, yeah, you know, we'll put you somewhere else. But then also thinking about Nicole, right? I think Nicole is an important character to, to like really dive into. Um, because she says, I forget. You know, like, you know, there's different drugs, like uh, Esteban only sells cocaine. Like that's just his thing. Uh, heck, I, I mean, there's you know, there's smack. heroin, smack, <laughs> yeah, there's all these like all these different. I mean, and they use a lot of uh, coded drug language, and different dealers only sell different things. And he kind of used that against them, like you know, like but when he was play, playing the the plan out, he was like, oh, you know, the the other drug dealer, I think it was Hector. He's like, wait, I thought he doesn't sell that. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, he's just you know, he's trying to move, you know, he's trying to move in with a you know, just really upselling it. But I remember his sister saying something along the lines of um, like either being with James because he has like the dope smack, the dope smack. And then thinking about the scene where she's in bed with Esteban. Um, I don't want to say strung out. I, I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's like that. Like if, for me, like seeing that scene, it, it looked like she was on heroin. Just because seeing like seeing her body gesture and seeing like her eyes is glazed over. But thinking about she's with Esteban. Esteban only sells coke. So I don't know if, you know, coke doesn't really, cocaine doesn't leave you kind of laid out like that. Also, um, I don't think she was on heroin because uh, when the film starts, you see uh, Fresh talking to like one of the, I guess it's, it's somebody he's running, he needs to pick up from and right. and is, and he's counting, he, he's, he, he didn't even count it, bro. He just, he felt the way it was like, yo, this is right, off. Right. And, he, and then they, and then they, like you said, the cinematography, they pan over to the woman's arm and you see her, you get to Kelly see that she, yeah. Yeah, that she, 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 she's shooting up, but you never yeah. see that with his sister at all. They never show his sister in the whole film doing any type of drugs or being shot up. So I don't think, I don't think she was, she was, uh, using heroin. I think it, I definitely think it was a crack. And I also think, yeah. uh, not, not to, I don't want you to lose your thought, but I, I, I also no. think, um, she a lot of the times we saw her, she wasn't strung out. There was only a couple of times we saw her where she was like really doped up. But there were other times she was very she was co- cohesive, like she was there, right, uh, right. coherent, coherent. Right. Um, she but, was but there. I, 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 I think yeah, I, mean, I definitely agree. But I think that's also we we you only see her a few limited times, right? So my my general concern, right, is that he's. He thinks he knows what's best for her, but her actions and her choices showed me that, you know, she still wants to, you know, live whatever that lifestyle is, right? Um, when, you know, she's with James initially, Fresh goes to speak to Esteban, Esteban, when he, you know, he walks in with Chucky and she's on the couch and Esteban's like, thank you for bringing her back to me. Um, and like initially, right, in the previous scene when he was talking to her, he's like, oh, you know, I'm not going to be some um, some Spix nigger queen or something like, something like that. So you, like there's this defiance of not wanting to be viewed in a certain light, but then you see her still kind of going into that darkness and that dark world. And in one of the last scenes when he's in one of the, Esteban, one of the apartments that Esteban has, cops come over. 
because he had a cop's contact card and he sent the cops there to, you know, create a scene to set Esteban up. So Esteban, so the cops come in and they're like, um, you know, we heard there we heard there was there was yelling and fighting and he goes to Nicole and she's like, no, there's like none of that's happening. At first she's like, she's scared. He said he's gonna kill her. And he's just sent, he's creating this tall tale to to make the officer believe that his sister and his, that both of their lives are in danger. But his sister says, This nigga's lying, yeah. right? Remember that? Yeah. This nigga, this nigga, not, 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 he's lying. This nigga, like he's just yeah. some, like he's just nobody. This nigga's lying. And I, I, yeah, I felt a way about that, man. And that made me think that it, it, it doesn't end well. I feel like the story doesn't end well for them. Um, I think, I, I feel like all his hard work is for nothing because of the language. Cause I, like, at no point do you see his sister just having this realization, like, like, oh, like he 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 cares and he's like trying to look out for me. This nigga is lying. Like he's just somebody off the street, man. And you know, kind of tying to you know what his last word is. I also wanted to ask, like, what, what do you think the next story is like? Thinking about what we've seen and know of his sister, the language she uses, and how much Fresh wants to kind of escape that world and save her. Do you feel that Nicole honors that? Do you feel like Nicole is? I mean, whether it's clean, like, I'm not sure if he was really upset about his sister using drug, but do you think she's happy to kind of be free and away from all of that? Because it, it seemed like she kind of enjoyed enjoyed the lifestyle to an extent. Yeah, well, well you know, two things come to mind. One, one I definitely want to bring up is that he, th- there was not one time in the film that I saw, I, I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, where he actually supplies his sister with drugs. Um, no. th- not once, um, which is something I thought was, was, was very important because there's a lot of films I've seen. And even in the lifestyle, you see family members hook all the family members up and, you know, it, 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 yeah, I'm in the game, but I'm not, you're not going to get it from me. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so that was something I thought was super powerful. But, um, but to answer your question, um, I actually agree with you. I think that it doesn't end well. I think that she had no problem being who she is and where she was. Um, I, you know, I feel like at the end of the film where he's like, they're like, oh, we're going to put you in witness protection. He's like, yeah, but what about my sister? My sister got to come in the face. She makes like, like basically like leave me out of it. (laughs) Like, I don't want to come. That, you know, this, this kid loves his sister, but his sister don't love him. Um, and maybe she no, loves him. No, but nobody loves him. Do you feel like we're starting to? Do you feel like anybody loves him? Honestly, I, I feel like you know his dad sh- showed him love the best way he could. Right. Um, I feel like there was, you know, you know, we don't hear much about his mom. We don't hear much about, like, I, I know, I, I think she passed away, but that's all I know. I don't, I don't think, I don't even think they, they bring that up. Um, and it, and his dad, you know, it, it's a, it's assumed that his dad can't take care of him or his dad is stronger. I don't know. Cause he was like, I'm not supposed to be around you. I'm not even supposed to be talking to you. And so I was like, maybe there's a restraint or like, I don't know. Maybe there was something that happened with his mom and his dad. They don't really go into that. Um, but, but I do think, I do believe his dad loves him. I do believe his system might've had love for him at some point, but the game, the game took that away from her. Um, and I, I, I actually do believe that, Esteban and 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 some of these dealers had love for this kid. Like he was great at what he did, right, right, and right. they and they loved him for it. And that's why he was able to set them up the way he set them up. Yeah. He he wouldn't have been able to do that if they didn't have have some type of love or respect for him. Um, and the way I think I think, I think respect more so. Right? I'm just saying. Yeah. I I just feel like the way uh, you know Esteban always made sure he was like, hey, you want to eat? You want like I, I feel like because he was doing what he was doing at a high level. There was a level of love, but it, it, it's not like love from from a family member. It was more so like, I love you for making sure my shit is running. <laughs> you know, my, my yeah. business is running. Um, because because he was in Esteban's houses, you know, he he was one of those kids that everywhere he went, he was welcomed. And, and every room, there was even that, that scene where he goes and he's like, I need to talk to, I forgot who it was, Heck, maybe Hector. Hector. And the guy's yeah. like, the guy's like, I'm, I'm Hector. Hector. He's like, man, you, like, you know, motherfucker, Hector, you yeah. pussy bitch. And so he calls about his right, name. Right, 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 he's right, like, right. yo, go get Hector. And to me, it, it was scenes like that where he he earned his, his respect in the game. 
and that allowed him to have these these conversations. Um, so yeah, I really believe that his sister is, you know, if they made a, a fresh two, we would see him going to the hood trying to get his sister back out because she literally. I like that. I like that. She was in the streets. That's just what. Right, right. She, and she and she she also gave her. She also thought she was. She also thought she was more than what she was. I felt like there was. She was like, well, "What does that mean? What yeah, does that I'm, mean I'm, more than what she was?" I'm about to. I'm about to. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that there were times where she thought she was in control of the of the situation, and she wasn't based on her being, you know, an abuser of drugs. She she basically told Esteban, "She's like, yo, I, you don't own me. Like, yeah. I'm, I, I go where I want to go, and yeah. I see who I want to see. I see. Yeah. I, I don't belong to nobody." Right and 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 it, it she says that but it but the, all her interactions she looks like she belongs to these people <laughs> like right. she's a right. she's literally in these situations with these people and that that scene the scene where she says that is actually a scene after pretty sure it's a scene after we see her naked in the bed with Esteban it's not before it's after from from yeah it, it's what it's when the the cops yeah so that um, that was later on yeah. so so. It, in my head, I'm like, I'm calling bullshit because I just saw you strung out naked with this guy who kisses you with your brother. Like, it looked like somebody that owned you to me. <laughs> it don't look like you there by choice. And then you come back and you like, nigga, you don't owe me. I go, I go where the best where the best drugs are. That's where I go. Right, right, right. I go where wherever the best is. So, yeah, I, I definitely see her wherever she goes, unless she got like into rehab or got that, you know gone through some type of program but I don't yeah I, I, I don't I don't see her taking that route because she the lifestyle she lived she 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 wanted to be in yeah I, I like that you brought up control and um you brought up the the example of him being at Esteban's house um and Esteban offering him food and throughout the movie you you you, you see that he is always in control right as a true chess master he is always in control of every situation so like one of the early scenes when he's you know, sitting on a car selling and he has all the lookouts, the dude is like, um, you know, how much for a pop? He's like five. He's like, I give you 20 for four. He's like, man, I think I know math. Five times five is 25. It's $25. Um, he, he doesn't allow anyone to have any control over him or even to think that they have control over him. Right. So they're like, you know, the, the scenes where he's going to, I forget the, the black, is it Corky? Yeah, Cork, he goes to Corky, yep. and he's like, oh, you know what? Like, I, I, you know, I, I need to get paid. <laughs> I need to get paid, right? And he always he plays this victim role well. Not so much being a victim, but like seeing that he's here for um, he like I, I need what's owed to me, right? It's not I, I need you. I need what's owed to me. I need what's owed to me. Um, so like the scene with Esteban, you know, Esteban offers him food, and he says no, and I think the real reason is is showing that he 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 doesn't you never want to show people that you're dependent on them. You never want to show people that life is hard. Like oh, food. Like damn, yo, I haven't eaten in weeks. Like nah, I'm good. Even if you're starving, like that's something my mother told me. Even if you're starving, right? I'm good. I have food at home. I don't, I don't need you to take care of me. I don't know you. I don't need you to have any type of dominion or think you have any control over my life. And I think that that's you know that you know, ties in again with the um the. The, the chess scene, or the, I guess it's the chess theme. Um, so, like, to kind of bring it to modern day, right? Like, what, what, I was trying to think of what what would be, what would like a modern day fresh look like, right? You know, like the drug game isn't what the drug game is in the nineties, right? So, my first initial thought was like, is he hustling sneakers or something? But what would a, a modern day fresh kind of look like, or or what 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 themes are we still kind of going through where, you know, history repeats itself and with, 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 with a story like Fresh? Uh, can, can I make a quick point? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, uh, I, I disagree with you. I actually do think someone does have control over him. Okay. And I, and I, I believe it's his teacher. Um, and it, it was obviously a very short scene, but there was a lot of significance in that for me. How how you know the film starts out and he's just really really focused on getting to class but even when he gets there there's no talk back 
There's no come for her. There's no yeah. disrespect. She's like asking him, like, hey, why are you late? Why are you late? And obviously he can't tell her exactly why. All right. Um, and then he goes to his locker, gets his books, you know, uh, and then <laughs> then he then he discovers that he didn't give all the drugs to to uh to to to, to one of the, the drops. But when he goes to sit down, she tells him, No, 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 no. <laughs> You can't sit next to Chucky. Right. You got, you know, you got to sit somewhere. And I just feel like the, how she, how she talked to him, he didn't, there was no pushback. There was no call out of her name. There was just right. a level of receipt. He just did what she said. Um, so I do feel like there was someone, and when I say control, I may be a little, it may, it may be a little deeper, but I, I just think in that situation, from an educational standpoint, from a respect standpoint, you never see him call out a name, and I and we saw him call many people like motherfuckers, bitches. Right, right, right. He not once did he disrespect his teacher. Also, he, he didn't really disrespect his aunt, but they didn't really have much. You know, I think he was thankful, but um, so I just I just wanted to to make that point. I do I do think the teacher and education was something which you never hear his father talk about. You never hear anybody emphasize education <laughs> for him. Right, right, he just right. kind of knew. Um, well, no, I think um, I guess there's two points. I, I mean. I, you, you, what you kind of brought in, I think it really just is respect. I don't think it's control. Yeah. He disrespects her. He, he doesn't respect any of the drug dealers because he sees what they're doing. He's just using them as a means to an end. Um, and I think Esteban did bring up school once. Um, I think Esteban didn't bring it up. Like, you know, I'm always looking for you, but you're always going to school. And he's like, you know, like, you know, I, I respect that. Okay. Yeah. I, I, uh, and I, I, I agree. I think it's more so sort of respect. And it really, it really bothered me, the home life, like how his grandmother didn't speak to him. You know, he came and he's like, hi, grandma. She kind of like straight ignored him, <laughs> like paid him no mind. And his aunt, she, she seemed Ashamed. like, a, yeah, his aunt seemed like a nice person, but she, you know, having to take care of all these kids is not easy. Um, and, and his aunt, someone who was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I want Nicole to stay. I want you to be with the family. We love you here. And and uh, willing to give up her bed. She's like, yo, you can stay in my room and stay in my bed. For, I'll sleep with the kids. And Nicole's just like, nah, nah, I'm good. Um, and then and then even Nicole's saying, nobody loves me. And Fresh is like, I love you. Like, I love you. Right. You know, there's so many, there's so much of that happening that just was, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was hard to watch. It was definitely hard to watch. So, um, but, uh, but to answer your question around, I guess I'm modern day Fresh. I don't, I don't, I don't know. You're right. The drug game's different now. Um, I think a lot of it now is, is, I don't know. You, 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 there's so many different things that people abuse these days. It ain't, it ain't, <laughs> it ain't drugs. Right, right. You know, you got, you got the, the gamblers, and um, I feel like there's a lot that I see. I, I could definitely see. I, I what popped to my head immediately was like an episode I watched on Vice with like these call scams. <laughs> Right, you know, right, right. I, I could see him doing something like, you know, these, these international calls and getting people to send you money, maybe something like that. Or there's a lot happening, um, which is very, very sad around prostitution and the prostitution of young women, you know, especially in some of these. I don't know. There's a lot happening in like Atlanta and Miami and some of these, these states where women, young women are coming up missing and, you know, come, they're, they're being uh, essentially put to work from a prostitution standpoint. Um so I, you know, maybe maybe him getting into something like that, but I I don't know, man. Like you're right, the drug game obviously is still out there, and you know we have people using a, a lot of it is uh, uh, you know medical medical drugs like you yeah. know opi yeah. opioids and oxycodone and all that stuff. So a lot of it is that, but um, yeah, I, there's so many different areas he could. I, I could definitely see him like <laughs> running the table. Like I got this. Right, right, right. Um, so yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it does. Yeah. I, I, I was thinking scams for the most. I was thinking PPP loans because that's like the most recent scam that people have been doing. So yeah, I definitely see uh, see scamming. Um, I guess like to, the second part of the question was, you know, what are some of the issues we're still dealing with from 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 you know rewatching the movie? What, what do you think is still lingering or ongoing? What, what's still culturally significant? Um, like one thing that stood out to me, and 
It sounds it, it sounds it sounds weird, right? So I was I had this thought like a while back, like look, look, listening to rap, listening to artists, and every time they make a, a reference about drugs and the supplier and the dudes hooking them up in the hood, it's always poppy. So it's poppy, poppy getting me the drugs, poppy getting me connect, right? And then they, you know they're selling drugs to the community, um, and so there's always this high regard for you know Puerto Rican and Dom- Dominicans and Cubans for their connection to the drug game and them kind of being the overlord of drugs and black people just kind of being the workers. So initially I, I went into this film, this like, ah, oh, it's going to be one of these things again, but I was happy to see Corky just, you know, have his own thing, man. I was happy to see Corky have his own thing. I thought about New Jack City um, and feeling like New Jack City is probably one of the, maybe like the one of the few black kingpin drug movies. Um, and I guess really just kind of comparing it to, I guess, like the language in hip hop, like no one, I mean, granted, you know, we have like Nicky Bonds, um, Alpo from Harlem, but I guess in, in, rap, in rap, it just feels like the, the majority of it is, you know, giving props to Hispanics who watch black people pollute their own community. Um, and, you know, part of the problem. So, Oh, hey, I don't. I don't have a transition. I, I, I gotta finish that though. Go ahead if you have anything. Sorry. Well, what was the question again? Because I, I lost lost it. Um, I guess ongoing issues or themes from the from the show that are still going on culturally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I was, I was I was looking at it on a, on a racial aspect. Of, yeah. I mean, yeah. This whole is the racial aspect. Right? Yeah. That's 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 it right there. Like you know, yeah. you know, you 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 look at gun and gang violence. And in these cities, you know, cities like Chicago, um, and and it's just it, it's 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 running rapid, especially during this the pandemic. You actually, um, I know some of these cities, a lot of uh, the gang violence kind of went down for a little bit during the, <laughs> the beginning of the pandemic, right. and then it just kind of just started going back up. I know here in Philadelphia, where I live, um, the murder rate, especially when it comes to like innocent bystanders, is crazy. It's, ridiculous the innocent people kids um children are being killed um and that and that's something we saw in the film where you had this this young man get shot for no reason and then they have the innocent boss and this young woman who literally play, you know they're playing in the playground and you know she ends up shot so you know obviously gun violence is something that is is huge and and i i hate to i hate to go back 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 but but you know it, it reminds me of what you were saying where you have these athletes who sign these deals, but gun violence is rap- running rapid in these cities. And I'm not saying go downtown and downtown <laughs> Chicago and, you know, but maybe right, that's what right. it takes. Maybe, maybe it takes the, 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 the Chicago Bulls team to have a week where they're cleaning the streets, you know? Um, but uh, that, that just popped into my head where you talk about these athletes who, who their impact is so big. Why not have these conversations? But also we have to keep in mind too, a lot of these people come from these backgrounds already. They already have Todd City's right. backgrounds, um, so they still some of them still have Todd's, but they they uh, they they uh, distance themselves. Um, but to stay on topic, I think you know when it comes to where we are as as a community as a nation, I will say I don't, and I'm 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 going on thirty five years old. I don't see many young people out here slinging drugs at twelve years old. <laughs> Right. I just don't see that. It's not some, you know, something I see. Maybe but they shoot. They shoot us now. Though. That's that's right. That's the that's that, that's, that's the unfortunate. I, I I rather them sell drugs than be shooters, right? <laughs> like, but that, that's the point. That's, 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 that's going to be my next point. You know, you hear yeah. so, you hear them taking off each other. You hear them, you know, getting into these little gang wars and territory wars and shit like that. But you know, the, I don't I don't I don't know how to. I'm not in that lifestyle anymore, so I really don't know how the drug game is these days, other than to say that there's so much uh, happening from a law enforcement standpoint too, where you have these specific divisions and, you know, back in those days, there weren't divisions like there are now where there's a narcotics right, right. division and it, they may have been, but it, they weren't as fine tuned as they are now. Um, you know, you got like cyber divisions and social media divisions in, in law enforcement um, that I didn't, I don't necessarily remember growing up. So, um, so yeah, I hope yeah, I, I think that is uh, kind of where we are now. Right, and 
I guess one, one thing that kind of um, came to mind, and it was a note that I had earlier, like the thing about going back to like uh, fragile male egos and thinking about how, like going back to re- respect for Fresh, right? And how much respect these older men had for him, that he was able to kind of weave this tall tale and they, they believed him. Um, but also thinking about how dumb they are, right? Like, like, you know, when um, when he blamed, J- when he said that he was like slinging on the side with Jake because Jake and um, Jake's man, I think his name, I lost the page. Um, they were trying to take over Corky's business. I think it was uh, Smokey. Jake and, and Smokey, you know, he's like, oh, nah, you know, Jake, Jake and Smokey say they can't wait to kill you and take over your business. And it's like, you've been working with, Jake for like three years. Like, you, yeah, you know he's a hothead. Yeah, you know he's all of this. But you're, you're going to take a 12-year-old's word over it. And granted, again, you know, he, he set up the pieces lovely, right? Lovely. Uh, Corky called Hector. Hector's like, well, like, no, I don't want no problems. Like, you said you want to go call me. But I, I don't I don't know, man. It, it, it's like my initial thought, like just now I was thinking about um, like how the Black Panther Party kind of fell apart, right? Just having the FBI send notes to different black gang leaders and, you know, just creating this f- fake tension and how easily things get dismantled from miscommunication um, and through fragile egos, right? Instead of like having a conversation, having to sit down, you just you let the narrative kind of work and, it, 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 you know, it's easier, right? It's easier to, I mean, granted, like, Corky's also paranoid, right? Like in the first scene when you first meet Corky, um, they're playing cards and Corky's talking to Fresh. And I think it's Smokey or, or someone else that yeah. works for Corky. They pull a card. He's like, what the f- fuck are you doing? He's like, yo, I'm getting a card. He's like, don't you ever do anything behind my back? He's like, but it's my turn. He said, I don't, I don't care. I don't care. Don't ever do, don't ever be sneaky and do anything behind my back. So you see the paranoia that's innately in him. So, you know, I get, I, I definitely get that, that, that the paranoia and the fear and the ability to easily, I mean, maybe Fresh saw that, right? Maybe that's, I was about to maybe say, that's, yeah, I was about to yeah, say, maybe he took a mental note right there. He was like, <laughs> that, that, that was like, this, this dude got, this dude has a weak ego and I just yeah. have to play to that. So like, like for James, they were, really, it wasn't really anything. James wasn't a really a, a heavy player. So he used the heavy, the heavy hitters, right? He used Corky to get at Jake, to, to Jake murder, murdering. Um, I mean, like, so I want to assume that Jake was the one that kind of robbed him. But he used Corky to get at Jake to clean up his work. He used uh, Esteban. Oh, you mean robbed him, robbed him and uh, him and Chucky? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I feel like for, for me, had, I really feel like it was Jake. It was Jake because how did how did uh, how did he, they end up getting the drugs? He had, they had to get it off. Right. It took it off of it took it off of Chucky. That's how they but got no, remember he 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 switched Ch- Chucky's bag and he put rocks in Chucky's bag. Yeah, when he went to the yeah, but he dropped both bags. He he, he, right, switched, right, right, right. he switched one bag. I thought, I thought I thought he switched. No, I thought he switched. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, he switched one bag, and he gave Chucky okay. he gave Chucky the the off bag because he knew Chucky was bugging. So he switched he switched one right, bag, right, 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 yeah, and then right, he right, took right, both right. bags and he dropped them both. He dropped his and Chucky dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't. He yeah, just that, ran. That's, yeah, and that's what allowed him to have the. The two bags to place him to the bed. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and then um, when, and then when uh, uh, what's what's a, what's you just said the guy's name, the dealer. I always forget his name. Corky. You know, Corky. Jake, when Corky, Hector, okay. yeah, when Corky was talking to him and he opened the book, he was like, "Where'd you get this from?" That's that's what Jake took from Chucky when they killed right, right. when they killed Chucky. Um, yeah. Which once again, you know, you bring up a great point. The, Throughout the first, you know, half an hour, forty five minutes of the film, everything that's happening, you could just see him taking mental notes. Right. Just taking like you just see it, they show his face and he's just sitting there stoic mental note. Um and and uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I think when when Corgi did that and he took a mental note, like boom. But I also think which we don't we don't talk about is the money. Everything is money. And the fact that he saved his money and used that money because you know twelve year olds don't do that. Right. So, so right. yeah, yeah, they were somewhat naive, but also most twelve year olds don't don't move that sophisticated. Like he 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 his plan worked because he had the the money to back it up. You know, if if he didn't if if he didn't back it up with his own bread, 
it, 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 all that, the whole plan wouldn't have worked. But the fact that that's why it's hard for me to believe that when I first saw, I was like, yo, I took notes. I'm like, man, it's great to see this young man saving. He's trying to get out the hood. I actually believe he, he was, he was plotting long, a long time. Yeah. He was like, yo, I'm gonna get these guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get these guys, you know, because the whole thing with his sister, with that first scene where he's talking to the, uh, I, I, I'm gonna call him the 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 bitch, <laughs> but he's talking to the dude the dude that's like kind of watching over the women, and, uh, and he's like, "Yo, don't talk about my sister." That first scene in my in my mind, I feel like he was plotting. He was putting he was putting the pieces together. Um, right. So that that's what made it work. It, yeah, yeah, the adults are naive, but I also think a lot of it worked because he put the puzzle piece together. But it was because he purchased his own drugs. <laughs> he purchased his own dope. Put his money where his mouth was, and everybody's in their mind is like, "How the hell is this kid? He didn't he didn't come up with this bread." That's what that's what Jake was saying. Right. Jake was like, it, "It was funny when Jake like put it together." Jake's like, "Maybe he's the one that <laughs> that got the dough." He's like, "How am I gonna get five thousand dollars right there? What am I gonna get five thousand dollars from?" Right. Yeah. So it, he just it was just well thought out chess chess board. Even when he hustled the guys in the park, that was that was. Oh, he didn't even hustle the guys, but he like played the guy, and uh, the guy tried to hustle him, and he smacked him. Like he, he, he which scene? Sorry, the scene. I think it's like the first chess scene when the guy, it, the Hispanic guy, beats somebody in chess, and then fresh oh, yeah. is down. And he's like, "Hey, I got money." The guy's like, "I don't want to play." And the guy, he's like, "Yeah, I got money." He ends up beating the guy. Um, oh, even that scene, I feel like he was always one step ahead of the game, always. And then finally, when he when he was able to get it, get get when he was able to essentially checkmate, it was it was time to release. Right. I, I like that you bring up that scene. I'm thinking about when he's with his. He, he finally goes. I think maybe for the first time goes goes to Sam his dad's house. I think he's like in a, he's in a trailer, and he's talking about all the different chess. Sam is talking about all the different chess masters he's met. Um, and he's like, yeah, he's good, but he's like. Put him on a clock, I'll smoke his ass, right? He's like, these people haven't dealt with real pressure. And I was thinking about um, how, th- always thinking about culture, right? So thinking about, you know, white chess masters and the, li- the lifestyles they're traditionally used to. Um, you think about like a lot of great chess masters that come from Russia. Like Russia's a, a harsh country to live in, right? But you also think about the inner city youth, right? And the, the lifestyle they have to go through. Like you think about someone like Fresh and the lifestyle he has to go through outside of the world of chess. And being able to kind of, it, it balances out, right? Chess, he, he already innately lives in a world where they're king and queens and pawns, right? He's already innately living in that real world. Chess just makes it into a situation where he can control and learn how to move the pieces around. Um, so like going back to the the first scene where he's playing the, the Hispanic guy who you know arrogant initially yep. he sees that so the, the guy again he, he uses that to the, to his advantage he plays his opponent he knows that this guy thinks he's all that ah uh, you're just a kid you're not good but once the kid gets you in check the first time like, what you start sweating now you're under pressure now you're off balance and that's how you that's how you that's how you beat people right you, you you always play your opponent, man. You always play your opponent. Yeah, he actually says he's like mating three or four, and the guy's like nah, and then he makes a move, and he's like now nah, it's me, and, and then the next move was mate, and he's like now nah, you lost quicker. <laughs> yeah, he said like, it could it could have been a four if you were smart or something like that, right, right, right. right. Um, so yeah, it, it, I, like I said, man, I, I was I was blown away by his composure throughout the film and and how he just played his part. He played his part. Even when when he like takes the gun out of the the car after you know Esteban tells the guys to get rid of the car and the gun, and and he just does that so seamless. He's like he's like yo, you know, I I, I gotta go do this. So I gotta take care of this. So I gotta. Right. But when he gets to Esteban's house, he's like, my aunt wouldn't let me in. Like he always had, uh, he was always ready for whatever someone had to throw at him. Um. And, and not only from the hood perspective, but even to the cops. One of the cops was being super dis- the, the cop that was calling him, you want to be in the zoo with the animals, da, da, da. And he, he just was uh, a, he, a, a stoic. He was just like, I got nothing to say. <laughs> I got nothing to say. Um, and if, if that was me, I'd be like, who the fuck are you talking to, my dude? Like, like other people, you know how many people 
break under that type of pressure, and you got this kid who's just like, I got nothing to say. Got nothing right, to say. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I just uh, – I, 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 I really love how he was able to mastermind a plan, complete, complete the task, complete the objective, and like you said, we don't know what's next, but hopefully whatever whatever it is, his sister get her shit together. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think overall the film just, it's really good stuff. What, what, what would you give it? I mean, I, I thought we, we've never done a rating, but how, how would you rate it overall? Out of what? Ten. I would probably, you know, it, Based on us talking about it for the podcast, I'd probably say like an eight or nine. Um, it's just because I lived that lifestyle, so it reminds me. It was extremely authentic. Even some of the scenes, that the graphic scenes, they happen so quickly that it just catches you by surprise. You're like, oh shit, what just happened? <laughs> kind of like jump out of your seat for a second. Um, so yeah, I, I, and, and I thought it was well, well written. The storyline was great. I, I wish there was a little more background about him. That would have been nice, just, you know, about his dad and his mom and how they got to his, his aunt. Right. That would have been, you know, that would have been good to know. But, and how he got into the drug, because I, I, initially I thought he got into the drug game because his sister. That's how they made it sound, but I don't, I don't know, like, how he started doing, like, maybe they, you know, they show a flashback of, you know, maybe Esteban going up to him and being like, hey, man, you want to make some money or something? Um I feel like it's, it's it's from his sister. Um, you know, his his sister is viewed as like just this beautiful prize throughout the community. Like right? Samuel Jackson, her sister Sam talks about how beautiful she is. Um, everyone, all the the drug dealers, he talks about. Everyone that talks about his sister talks about how beautiful and lovely she is. So you know, innately in the hood, right? If your sister's someone that's chased after, people try to get in favor with you. To your sister, just like Esteban did, to, and he was like, you know, thank you for bringing her back to me. Um, so yeah, I, I think his sister was kind of paved the way. It just this, like I, I looked it up real quick, and I, they, they they do label his sister as a drug addict, which I didn't. Like, I think we said earlier, um, it didn't seem like that. I mean, a few scenes, you know, we see her, we see her in different areas, but we never seen her like being an addict. But she is described as being a, a drug addict, so I think that that's kind of the easy way to get into the game. Yeah, but she also what, what I didn't understand. Is that she seemed like the only woman in the whole city? Like, like I that threw no, me no, off. you 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 had the fiends, right? The fiends who was like, "Yo, like, come on!" Like he said, "Yo, please talk to Jake." He's like, "Tell tell Jake, you know, I, I you know I, I'll, I'll top him off right now." She's like, "You know, Jake, 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 you know, Jake only mess with fine sisters." And she's like, "Yo, how about you? I'll suck you off right now." He's like, "Yo," he's, and he slaps her, right? He said, "Yo, he's the fuck out of here." And she's like, "Come on, yo, I, yo, let's go, on, let's go on this car right here, yo, I, yo, I did, yo, this, this pussy good. It's crazy, man. It, it, yeah, and but... it, it's crazier because that's the, yo, like, that's really how it was, man. That's really how it was back then. It's, it's cr- it, like thinking about that at this age, like, yo, that's really how it was back then, man. That's really how but, it was. But, but his sister and that woman wasn't the only woman in the whole city." No, no, I understand that, but that's what it's 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 his story, so it's gonna be local to women. I'm just saying. I, I saw. I I was just so. I I, I I didn't really understand why they were so mesmerized by his sister, um, and uh, I, no, I mean every, every everybody everybody was mesmerized by his sister. Everybody, right. but every every hood, every block, every area has one woman that everyone wants. His sister was that woman. Yeah, I mean that, that, that's my experience. Yeah, yeah. And there's one woman that everybody wants, but there are other women that everybody people get. Like there was literally, you know, you had Esteban's wife, you know, because because I guess he, he says you're married, um, and and his child, and he's and he's and he's you know putting the child to bed. But other than that, you really don't see. And and at the beginning, you see you know, the the five or six women. Um, that's pretty much it um, throughout the throughout the film. But like you said, it maybe it's because of his story. Um, so that, that makes sense, but I, I just, I was just like, yo, his sister, she, she's, she's all right, like, all right, cool, <laughs> like, but there's so many other women in the world, like, so you tell me when, when, uh, when, uh, his sister, Nicole, when she's with Esteban, James not, James is not doing that, he's sitting at home talking his thumbs, like, <laughs> nah. No, but, but that's the, that's the game, right? <laughs> the, 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 remember, we're going back to fragile male egos, right? 
The point is that I want to own you. I want to have you as a woman because everyone wants you, right? That's why Esteban is supposed to be the kingpin. Everyone wants to be the kingpin, right? So not only do you run the streets, you own the streets, you have the baddest woman that everyone wants. Yeah, you're doing what you want to do. Yeah, you're sleeping around. It's like Nicole said. I, I, you know, I spend time with whoever I want. But as a man, your ego denotes that you should have everything and anyone and have the baddest of it all. I mean, I think that's part of the, part of the, the culture and experience. I, I mean, I, I hear you, I but accept. I think like there's, there's no, that's not acceptance. I hear you, but there's, you know, there's logic and there's, there's, there's like reason behind all of that, right? She's, she's the prize for everyone. Yeah, I just. I mean, whatever, whatever the reason is, right? We don't, we don't know why she's the prize. You don't. I mean, I, I think I think she's a beautiful woman. I think she's a beautiful woman. No, right? she like, is a beautiful I, woman. That, that's not the I'll, point. No, no, I, I understand. I understand. That's not the point. <laughs> I'm saying that, um, like I, 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 number one, I think it was dope that they revered his sister this much in the hood, right? Because traditionally, dark skinned women don't really get that much love in um in movies. I mean, in the past, like now, now it's, it's better. But I think it's dope that they they showed her as this prize. That for everyone, you know, Esteban, um, I'm not sure if Corky was interested in her, but, you know, the dudes that made comment that were working for Esteban um, and, uh, you know, James, everyone had this natural desire and the craving for her. I, I mean, I think, I think it's dope. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they definitely did a great job with that because I also was saying to myself when, when he was outside selling drugs that they was, he was selling to white people. It was no black. Like it was like a white guy that came up in a car, and then another white guy came up, and uh, I, it was just cool to see that they didn't just have these black people strung out that he was selling to. I don't yeah. even think he sold. I don't even think he sold to a black person you know, other than talking to that woman, the, the light skinned woman. But it was just two white. You know, these two white men. They looked like they they drove up, and even the one that tried to try to hustle them. Um, and I, I definitely appreciate that because. It, Black people, we're not the only people that use drugs, <laughs> so let's not let's. Right, right. They, they debunk that shit quick. Um, That's real quick. I just want to know his sister's played by I think it's N. Bush, right? She's also in Dead Presidents and Blade. So yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think overall, just to kind of kind of uh, close out on on this, unless you have anything else you want to add. Um, no, no, nothing major. Yeah, well, well, we'll close out on this. I, I think it was a great film to choose. So good, uh, good pick. Um, uh, you know, those of you who actually listen to this, we definitely suggest you check it out. Um, uh, when, those of you who actually listen, they listen. If they listen, and they listen. You know what I'm saying, people that are listening to this, I know, I know. definitely check out the film. Um, where can they find it again, Cliff? It's on Amazon Prime, but I think. From your experience and from what I now realize, you need a Paramount Plus account also. Okay, so Amazon Prime Paramount Plus account. Well, you can um, find a website. No, nope, don't, don't, don't take my don't take my 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 route. It took me a while, but I was able to. I was able to find it. Uh, that's hilarious. Um, but yeah, the, you know, this is this is kind of our. Uh, I guess this is kind of where we would we would leave it off and go go on to next. If you want to stay up to date and definitely stay up to date in everything we're doing, uh, you can follow us on IG under a Black Culture Podcast. Um, we also have TikTok now, which uh, is very exciting because I, I'm a person that doesn't rock with social media, but I am also on TikTok. So thank you, Cliff, for that. Um, so you also can follow us on TikTok, also under a Black Culture Podcast. Um, and yeah, just stay tuned. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for for our next episode. What are we doing next? Do you know? Uh, real quick, if, was, if you're listening and you, and you want to watch, you can go also on YouTube. Uh, Nothing moves without us. A Black Culture Podcast. Um, our next uh, episode is going to be. Are we do, do you want to do a clubhouse for this? I guess it don't always leave with that. Uh, no, I, I think the clubhouses we should leave to the TV shows. Cause that's, okay. Yeah. Um, I, mean, we, we, I didn't even know we talked about that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big decision. We've only been doing it for TV uh, shows. No, no, we did it for 444. Four, four. Um, no, we didn't. And we did not do yeah, a clubhouse. We, we did. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> we did two clubhouses. Oh, sorry, we did one Family Matters. We did one, and we did a second one. For whatever the second uh, theme was, and I think it was four, four, four. No testimony, and we were talking about the, the second one we did was last week. 
No, that was the third one. Do you remember the second one? The first one we did, Family Matters. Uh, I think that's when Temi was there. The next one we did, oh, no, we, we did had the, the white blonde people. dude from... We did the white, white people, you're right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so, yes, um, we're going to do a, a clubhouse <laughs> for this one. And we're going to edit out everything we just said. I'll edit it out. But, yeah. No, no, it's, it's all good. Um, we'll do a clubhouse. So we'll do it. I mean, this thing is a clubhouse. We're taking the month of August off to regroup and just kind of see different ways we can kind of get this out there a bit more. So we'll be back, uh, I believe, September 9th, maybe. I have to look at the final day, but we'll be back early September, and we'll we'll, you know, we'll post an update when we when we're coming back. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Cool. Well, thanks for listening. Until next time. Peace.